There were lots of analysis that was done by Marxists. And we tried to understand and learn from that tradition. So, how do we identify? Who do we think had the best Marxist understanding of those fascisms that we all agree were fascisms? Huh? The CPI and CPM, for them the most important thinker about this thing was Dimitrov. So today even Prabhupada, when he talks about it, will talk about Dimitrov. You also have, for example, Ajaz Ahmed talking about Gramsci. How Gramsci was very important because Gramsci's prison writings were about fascism. Right? You have others who talk about a person called Arthur Rosenberg, people like Jairus Banaji and others. The fascism within our school, in which there's a difference, if you like, between uh, uh, what do you call it, the ways in which collective psychology emerges and not an individual psychology, not just individual psychology. Anyway, I won't get into that. Uh, but uh, uh, a person called Arthur Rosenberg. So you've got Dimitrov, you've got Arthur Rosenberg, you've got uh, Gramsci here. My own approach, uh, and that doesn't mean that Chotsky was right about everything or whatever, or, every, not nothing, or even that Marx was right about everything. My own approach comes from Chotsky and then later other people like Mandel who developed upon it. Why do I think Chotsky was the most important thinker? Because Gramsci wrote very important points of course he did not take up so much on the cultural aspects. Huh? But Gramsci's theorizing about fascism came after fascism came to power in Italy. Dimitrov, Stalin Dimitrov, Stalin followed what was called a very disastrous policy in the third period of the Communist International which was called social fascism. He said the best way to delete Hitler is not to unite with the Social Democrats, which is the Workers' Party. Huh? And it is only after Hitler came to power in 1933 that you have the 7th Congress of the Comintern, in which Dimitrov comes and talks about how to fight about fascism, and then you have the whole business about what's called the Popular Front. So Dimitrov too huh, comes after. Trotsky was the only one that actually theorized the danger of fascism in Germany before it came to power and actually provided the best perspective of how to defeat it. Huh? In fact, Perry Anderson has said quite correctly that among all the classical Marxists, that is to say Marx, Engels, Lenin, Luxembourg, uh, Trotsky, others, Bukhar and others, this was the only serious attempt by any classical Marxist to theorize any form of the modern capitalist state. The capitalist state has had various forms. What was common to whether it was Lenin or whether it was Marx or whether it was Trotsky or what is else there is that they did not anticipate or expect that the bourgeois democratic form of the modern capitalist state would be so long and so enduring and so powerful. They never expected that. Remember that in the interwar period, World War I and World War II, the bourgeois democracies that were taking place in the Weimar Republic of Germany and Mussolini Hitler before Mussolini comes to power were discredited. Huh? And I think this is an important point. What is my approach? My approach is this thing here. And my understanding is see, understand fascism as a phenomenon in motion. Huh? See it as something in motion. My point is not so much that you have a biological analogy, that there is some force which has inside it, like a biological organism, a blueprint, which means that you will have the evolution of that into that. My approach is much more that it is not the fascist organism that matures, it is the fascist situation that matures. That is to say, my understanding of fascism, theoretically, is that it is a unity of three moments. What are those three moments? Fascism out of power. The question of a popular movement to gain support is very crucial. You have to also understand that you cannot have a fascism which comes to power and does not establish a fascist state. 
It has to establish a fascist state, and a fascist state is a very, very extreme and very distinctive form of a brutal authoritarian state. So you have one moment out of power, the second moment in power, and third moment is how it comes from out of power into power, which is not decided by the nature of the movement itself, is decided by the context. So you have a structure. In other words, the character of the capitalist crisis plays a very crucial role in also shaping the character of fascism out of power and in power. So for example, because of the capitalist crisis in the interwar period, Hitler's uh, uh, yeah, the question of the movement, according to this approach, is that the movement shifts the relationship of forces between the working people and the bourgeoisie. But the working class is not defeated or destroyed during the movement phase. Huh? It is challenged, it is pushed back. But when the fascist phase comes to power and has a fascist state, it crushes the independent organization of the working class. Crushes. This did not happen. In 1998, that year. When you say the corporate state, what both Hitler and what Mussolini did is controlled the whole working class movement and finished off all others' independent organization of the working class. That's my understanding. Also, it has to be ultra nationalist, it has to be militarist, and this is the difference between my approach and many others. Most Marxists say, yes, fascism is the most reactionary, it's, it's the most reactionary form of, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nationalist reaction. It's a very reactionary form of nationalism. Others say, not only is it a reactionary form of nationalism, it was also the most strongest form of international reaction. Don't forget that Hitler and Italy were central to the creation of world wars and fighting at the international level. If you don't accept this, then you can also think of fascism happening in any small country. In other words, what's being said here is that not only the, did the rise of fascism in the interwar period mean a terrible national reaction in the, uh, what do you call it, uh, in those countries, of Hitler, Germany and Italy, it also meant a tremendous shift in the overall international relationship of forces that took place. And this is very important for people like Eric Hobsbawm. Because what did Eric Hobsbawm say? He says, you cannot understand the rise of fascism in the interwar period and you cannot understand something that he called totally bizarre, completely strange. He said, what did you have during the Second World War, which was of course promoted by these countries? He said, you had a bizarre alliance between advanced liberal democratic capitalism and Stalin. Communists were broken away from capitalism. Isn't this extraordinary that you have a relationship against uh, the most reactionary form of capitalism, this thing? The most strongest attack on the enlightenment uh, virtues, if you like, to which both Marxism and liberalism come from. Huh? So liberal democracy has an alliance with a, uh, 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 a non-capitalist state, huh? whether you call it socialist, communist, etc., in order to fight against Germany and Italy, which they see as a bigger danger to them than even the communists. Huh? So, that's to bring in the international dimension. Nowadays, many Marxists and others don't talk about it. They talk about fascism in a backward country. It's coming, uh, LTT was fascist, this was fascist, that was fascist. Huh? Many people have said in Iran, it's clerical fascism. You heard the phrase, clerical fascism, right? But it's rather strange. Everybody agrees, most liberals and and Marxists agree that fascism is always ultra-nationalist. Ultra-nationalist. It takes on the banner of nationalism. But the Khomeini regime huh, in Iran, which is supposed to have set up a clerical fascism, 
is not an ultra-nationalist, it's a trans-nationalist force. Who is the enemy for Khomeini? Uh, 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 it opposes a foreign, this thing. Not in the name of the nation, but in the name of Islam. Who is the big enemy? The United States, not because it threatens the nation, but because it threatens Islam. Its appeal, I understand, was this. Huh? What is the name that it gave to the big enemy of the United States of America? Have you forgotten or remembered the term that was used by Khomeini and all that to characterize that? It was called the Great Satan. Right? That is to say, and in Semitic faiths, whether it's Christianity or Islam, the great enemy, the evildoer, is Satan. Incidentally, you find all kinds of strange developments with regard to the question of fascism during the classical period. Mussolini and Germany were not interested in religion. Huh? They were not. They were, not, they were secular. Huh? Elsewhere, in Europe, you had movements which were more closely attached to religion. Huh? Romania, Hungary, and you had there. Racism was central to Germany huh? against Jews. But it was not at all relevant for the Italians and the first class. In fact, Jews were overrepresented in the Mussolini's party. And Mussolini's uh, uh, fascist party used to laugh at the Germans for their preoccupation with anti-Jewishness. Uh, anti and it is only in 1938, under the pressure of, United, uh, of, of Germany, that they formed a fascist international, which says some things about that here. The other difference which I forgot to mention between Italy and Germany, both most autonomous uh, from the ruling classes, but Mussolini comes to power and reduces the importance of the party and makes the state much more important. In the case of Germany, Hitler maintains a party state. The party is key controller of the state. In the case of Mussolini, the party gets less and less important and diminished, gets absorbed by the state. But anyway, the variation. So even this question of racism is that central when you want to try to understand the question of fascism. Because you also had fascism, which you should not. In so far as there was some element of racism, in the case of Italy, it had to do with its imperial character, which was common to all the other liberal democracies, which talked about our justification in having more control over Abyssinia in the case of Italy and all, because they need to be civilized. They are more backward as compared to us. You see what happens is that racism also in the same. So I'm saying is that yeah. So Iraq, I mentioned that LTT, Iraq, Islamic State was transnational rather than ultranational as the year. What about this question that I mentioned here? That if you take the state seriously, there must be a maximization of its autonomy and its highly centralized character. Huh? Extremely centralized in this thing. Uh, much more so. That you will take seriously as a characteristic of fascism if you take seriously my approach, which is the unity of the three moments, in which rules out that there can be a fascism from above, because I'm saying there has to be a popular movement, uh, which is very, very important. There has to be a counter revolution of this, a crisis of a serious kind, and there has to be a fascist dictatorship, which is different from other forms of dictatorship. As I said, you don't have to accept that. Huh? But I thought it is important for me to at least give you my idea of thinking. Huh? Uh, 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 many people say that... Uh, <coughs> the other point I wanted to make about that period was in the case of all the interwar fascisms, the leader, the Führer principle, the leader was crucial. There was a rejection that was central to its popular appeal. And what was central to its popular appeal is that this kind of democracy that you're having after World War I, this kind of you know, position, 
this is nothing here. There is a superior democracy which is embodied in the leader who is the medium of access to that. In many ways, what Modi is doing is doing something quite direct. Huh? That here, he is trying to present himself. Huh? But Hitler and Mussolini did this. That they said, look at all these many problems of uh, democracy. This that we represent, in fact, we are the medium. Huh? The leader is speak as the very medium of the mass popular will. It's interesting that Modi, for example has done something I almost Nobel's is like. I cannot think of any other Prime Minister in India whose pictures are everywhere on the billboard and deliberately done in the, all the print media on this, that, etc. Every damn government scheme which came before him, which is minor, this thing will also have his picture on. There's a very conscious policy. He doesn't engage in dialogue because he can't really think that much. He's not really, he's a good orator, of course, but it's a direct relationship through the social media, creating that thing here. Yeah? But one of the things about the Indian context is that if there is one question, one element, the most important element in keeping Indian democracy going is that poor people, no matter how they live, have a commitment because they feel this is something at least that we have to have because it gives us some degree of power, even if it's only voting in some time and all the rest of it. Otherwise, the upper class, middle classes would be quite happy in moving towards authoritarianism. That. And that's something very interesting because it's indication of the whole question of the importance of bourgeois democracy, huh? which is very different from the past. What are the problems that are posed today for the fascist paradigm? In the interwar period, during the interwar period, just before the uh, of World War II, all the Marxists, nobody uh, all of them, all the major thinkers, they did two things they underestimated. They underestimated the productivity and capacity of capitalism to ride out its crisis and to continue and to develop. What did Lukács say? And what did Lenin agree with that? Lukács said, the actuality of the revolution. We are living in the period in which we have the actuality of the revolution. And what he meant by the actuality of the revolution was the imminence of revolution. Uh, they saw World War II, Lenin correctly predicted interwar, uh, all that, etc. Its perspective is very simple. Unite Hindus and militarize Hinduism. Savarkar. But how do you unite Hindus? There are only two ways that you can do it. You either try to find some principle that is internal to Hinduism to unite the Hindus around. And here the only serious candidate, which is their candidate, is a loose and accommodating Brahmanism. They'll accommodate, they'll adjust, they'll sit, Amit Shah will sit with Dalits and eat, but you're not going to have inter-caste marriages. You're not going to have a rejection of the Varna system. Huh? You're not going to have uh, uh, assaults on the sense of Brahmanism, which is connected to the idea that everybody from Kadi onwards, you have to do your duties within the uh, ascribed birth, and then for the future and all the rest of it here. They're not going to, but it's a loose and accommodating Brahmanism, but because of the caste system, they can only go so far. Huh? They've gone quite far, they've done very sensible things in the force of civil society, which is the force that has schools for tribals, uh, which is the, uh, the force that has the single largest network of private schools in this country. It's them. Uh, they are expanding there, they've got all kinds of things they do. How? It's like the Muslim Brotherhood. You actually gain support, not just by this question of, of course, uh, ideology and Hindutva and all that, you gain support from material needs that you address. The Muslim Brotherhood, powers of civil society addressing all of these things. Huh? If you come from a family and you have a, do a, a daughter who is ill and the RSS helps to get a doctor to save her life, you are going to be loyal to them for the rest of your life. Or you are going to be very sympathetic. They did that. The left, once upon a time, was able to do all that. So the question of the larger transformative project working there is very here. And, uh, the caste system is one. The other way that you can try to unite Hindus which has more chances, is to unite them against some outside other. And here the best candidates are of course Muslims, Christians to a lesser extent, but the institutions are more important than the, uh, the Christians. Huh? And um, what do you call it? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, my wife is a, uh, is a Syrian Christian. Her mother is a very religious. I am not uh, religious, neither, neither she nor me. But my, uh, uh, my, my, my wife's mother is very religious. So, uh, Ajaz Ahmed, who is a Muslim, 
and I was sick. We were sitting there, my wife and my wife's mother was there, and she was trying to convert Ajaz Ahmed and me, saying, you must become Christians. <laughs> so then Ajaz Ahmed said, listen, listen, leave us alone. I am a Muslim, he is a Sikh, huh? you are Christian, we are all people of the book, you please concentrate on converting the Hindus. <laughs> easier to unite uh, the varieties of Hindus and caste against another. And what we have seen on the communal front is very frightening. For the first time, you find it in rural areas. You find Dalits and tribals in Gujarat who have been part of that process of upward mobility. All of these things that are developing over here. Today's capitalism, no golden age, polarized politics. Because it cannot resolve the fundamental problems, you are going to find counter charge uh, visions and perspectives from the far right, which is growing, and the opportunity of the left. In some countries, the left is also growing. Huh? Whether it's uh, the problems in Podemos, in, in, in Portugal, in Greece, the Corbyn phenomenon, the occupied Bernie Sanders phenomenon, all of these are also polarized politics. You cannot separate, in my view, because I'm saying that, uh, uh, let me put it this way, we can don't, don't be too pessimistic, we can weaken. The Indian situation is not that they will continue to rise and rise. In many ways, it's the weakness of the opposition that is the biggest factor rather than the strengths of Modi and their, their forces. Uh, they can be significantly weakened and pushed back, uh, even in the shorter or medium term. It can happen. Uh, it depends upon many factors. But in the longer run, if we want a permanent defeat, of the enduring defeat of the far right. That's a much longer term thing. And in my view, cannot be separated from the question of moving towards socialism. That's the straightest that I view. The old golden age social democratic humanizing capitalism, forget it. It's not going to happen. Variety of reasons we have to work. What do we need to do? We have to build a cadre force. We have to intervene in society. And we have to have a unified class politics. What is my understanding, even in the short and medium term, of some kind of alliance structure? Yeah? And I will leave you with that. My understanding of alliance structure is not so much, it's a kind of three concentric circles. One, this, and this. In the first concentric circle, the more inner one, we have to strive for left unity vis-a-vis -vis these forces, whether you call them fascistic, fascist, or whatever. That's there. You have to strive as much as possible. We have in this country, we have so many independent left groups of various kinds who have learned the lessons of history over so many times earlier. They've done here. But we must try and connect with each other in some ways and build here. Uh, the second set is uh, even the mainstream left, I don't know how to tackle, but they're still different from the others. Uh, and from the Congress here. You got that uh, The second one is to actually also bring in progressive social movements. We have to do that. Huh? One of the tragedies is that the mainstream left has not acted as the tribune, even in parliament, of these various social movements. There's been a kind of tension between the larger left forces and the social movements, at least the mainstream <coughs> left. Huh? At least the social movements are suspicious of the mainstream left, and the mainstream left want to dominate huh? and control this thing. That comes from the old particular, particular history. But that second constructing circle is if you like the question of social movements and other progressive forces coming together. And the third circle, if you like, is our tactical understanding of how to connect to these other parties in some ways or whatever. I will not be unhappy if the AAP party, for all KJ this thing, wins in Punjab. Huh? Uh, this thing. I, mean, uh, I mean, I have a special six, so I really thought that uh, when, when Mohan Singh and Alwanya come to power, there will be a fundamental transformation because of the six. It didn't happen, but anyway, uh, my point here is that uh, uh, I will not be unhappy if the AAP comes to power there or, or, or go on. And if they come to power, what will happen is that the space will be opened up here. At the same time, I don't think that the, there is that much difference economically and, uh, and, and other issues between the AAP and say the Congress. Or they want to take over that particular space. Huh? They have not even defined themselves as a social democratic type of capitalist force. It seems to be, they are very careful not to, it seems to be that there are two kinds of neoliberalism. 
There is what is called disciplinary neoliberalism and there is compensatory neoliberalism. That is to say, a stricter form of neoliberalism and a neoliberalism with a somewhat human face. Uh, I think they are. But yet, a defeat for Modi in UP, which is the fifth largest country in the world in terms of population, uh, a defeat for him in Punjab or Goa is a good thing. Uh, we can't say, no, okay, uh, they are all as bad as others, whatever. It's a good thing. You know what that is. So, the third thing is also the question of what possibilities there are for making larger connections to some of these forces or whatever to fight that. So, that is the broad uh, framework that I have. Yeah, I think I finished now. So, that's really it. I, I, I should stop there and I must thank you for your indulgence. <coughs> I don't see this as an Indian fascism or an Indian fascism or a state from having fascist characteristics. And I'll try to explain uh, why that's the case. Right? Um, I think my view is that the use of the term fascism is uh, rather loose and imprecise. Uh, are there merits in such a use? The answer to this is actually yes and no. It's tricky. It can also be very positive because it's got some features to use it as a term of abuse. Uh, at the same time, it can also be counterproductive in particular contexts because the people that you are seeking to persuade at this case of fascism are not that impressed because they feel that's an exaggerated and uh, inaccurate thing. So it's a very tricky thing in terms of actually how uh, to use that. The point about it, whether it's an individual trait or a collective trait, those who argue that base themselves, for example, in the context, they base themselves on two things. I'm talking about Marxists. Uh, uh, Marxists uh, who based on two key thinkers that they felt were part of the left tradition and gave an insight. One thinker was William Reich, and the other was Jean Paul Sartre. Right? And their understanding was that there is an authoritative personality dimension every human being under capitalism. It's the construction of authoritarian personality element, right? Uh, so that I would explain from William Wright, I think it's because of various forms of uh, authoritarian socialization in which the question of patriarchy and the patriarchal family is absolutely central. From this, you have two different directions that have been taken. One following the building line is to talk about how this flowers into an individual personality that we can call fascist. Okay? The contribution to that can come from other sources alone, not from outside. Because it's the authoritative personality provides the necessary potential, but it doesn't just flower by itself. There are outside factors that come into mobilizing. Even for this current, they would say that this is the case. The other current is to say that don't take uh, uh, yeah, even this question of authority personality, it's really a collective psychology rather than an individual psychology. And what they mean by that is that the rather crucial dimension of which uh, is a really formation of a federation. Uh, they moved from the parliament system of Britain to their own system of democracy. This was a major shift. But in France, when the revolution took place a few years later, they moved from a, a monarchy to a non-monarchic way of governing themselves. That was a radical shift for them. Okay. So I want to maybe uh, to that question. Let me also add this response. Over the last 200 years, 300 years, 400 years, humans have chased one strong idea, and that idea is the idea of freedom. And the word freedom is not a single layer. It has many layers. For instance, humans have tried to free themselves from tyrannies, monarchies, and it appears that practically in every country people have succeeded.
in getting rid of monarchies, if the monarchies still exist, then they exist there in the ritual form and not in any substantial, such as in England or in uh, Holland. Humans have also chased the idea of freedom from labor. And in order to do that, they use what they call science and developed machines to reduce heavy labor that earlier you know, persons used to do, individuals used to do. At the time of building, let's say, the Taj Mahal or Charmina or whatever, people probably lifted those rocks with human strength. Or with very little, with very little mechanical aids, but today they don't do so. Uh, our grandmothers have had been grinding grains at home, but today mothers don't do so. It seems uh, 300 years back when a meeting of this kind happened, the speaker used to shout at the top of his or her. But today's speaker is using this. So we seem to have chased the idea of freeing humans from labor, from owners, from laborers. In our time, there appears to be a desire to free humans from production itself, from the act of production. And that is the idea is that in future, perhaps humans won't produce children the way they have been producing in the past. Science has been wanting to these things. Uh, in today's world, in order to be rich, you don't have to be a producing industrialist. You have to be a finance handler. That is, money will produce money. Not production will produce money. That kind of shit seems to have taken. This idea of freedom is compelling us in many, many different directions. And some of some of these compulsions are resulting both in oppressive regimes and liberating movements. So we should also try to understand what freedom really is for us and in future. Okay. You said something about the concept of individual likely to undergo some change. What according to you is the is meant by individual as it obtains today? What do you mean by that? In Indian languages, we use the term Vyakti. That is a metaphysical case. Uh, that is, that word, what I am saying is not my belief. Please don't mix up. I am only explaining the, the root of that word, Vyakti. The idea was that there is an energy pervasive energy in the world and the expression of that energy is a vivyakti or vyakti. We use, we use the term vyakti for every member of the species with two legs, you know, like us. We say he is a vyakti, he is a vyakti, do vyakti, give vyakti, match vyakti, whatever. Uh, for Latin and Greek, this idea did not come so easy. They counted member of the human clan, human uh, humanity, uh, human race, race is not a good term, but the human species in econometric terms. And so the term person came. In the 17th and 18th century, 
throughout Europe, a person was a legitimate citizen if he, I am saying he, because still they, they are not thought of women's rights at all, only if he was in some way related to land, own land, or uh, was engaged in some kind of work with a land owner. And uh, such persons were taxpayers. And a single tax paying person, <coughs> a tax paying person who could not be further subdivided, became indivisible. And therefore, the term individual came. You see, when, when this term came, a very sad thing happened and that is the rights of all those who are nomadic, pastoral, non-related to land, not land-based, they were completely taken away. Those persons were wiped out of the reckoning of the governments completely. They were made non-citizens forever. And perhaps you know that the result of that kind of understanding of citizens, citizenry, had a very terrible effect, very tragic effect in our country when the colonial English government created the Criminal Tribes Act of India, putting all the nomadic communities, all the pastoral communities, or almost all the pastoral communities under that act and treated them as prisoners who will contribute unpaid labor. All the bridges built during the British time here, all the railway tracks lay were laid by Indians who were not paid wages, who were from nomadic communities, who did not have land relationship and therefore who were not subject citizens. The rest of us were subject citizens. That is, so we, we became individuals in the English language and the nomads became a mass, an amorphous mass. So now the idea of individual is changing because the idea of how tax is to be labeled is changed all over the world. In future, we will come to be seen as a collection not of individuals but as digital addresses. Uh, it is not too far. We are already there. And that phase of human history is called post-truth phase of human history. But first let me describe how we arrived at that phase. Probably whatever I am saying might be leave a little uh, un might make a little uncomfortable because I am not talking the usual language. But I will come to a usual language after having said what I want to say. The human history is of about five life years. We became the kind of animal that we are about half a million years ago. For the first Approximately first two lakh years, we were exchanging thoughts through action, through gestures, through nodding of head or dance, like honeybees, honeybees communicate through dance. So we were like, when you are you know, shaking your head, that movement is inherited from the time which is five lakh years before our time. The next two lakh years, and that's my mind. It, is, it does not belong to Kannada language or French language or German language. It belongs to our oldest phase of existence, which were inherited. Uh, pointing a finger, for instance, belongs to oldest language. Uh, it was not verbal language. The next 200,000 years, two like years, they are spent in communication through music. Only tones. Where, you know, even today when my grandfather used to tell me stories, I would say, hmm, 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 in this form. But all those, all those uh, markers, all those signs are inherited 
70,000 years we started using the kind of language that I am speaking with you now. Human language, vocal language, using sound signals. Now, why am I mentioning this? Because these three phases had a very deep impact on the human brain. As you know, the action of dancing, the action of maintaining your balance, is controlled by the lower side of the, the lower back side of the brain. The controls are there. The grammar of that language through action was you should not fall down while speaking. And the control was from the back side of the brain. The music phase which led to the sound phase of communication. The controls are in the left lobe of the brain. There is an area called Broca's area. Now what happens, it's very interesting to know what happens there is. There are about 85 trillion neurons there. These neurons are almost like energy particles, electronic signals, uh, they don't occupy space, they don't occupy too much space, they occupy nano space, very little space. These neurons move to other parts of the brain and when we hear any sound, the meaning is abstracted because of their movements. Scientists are now telling us that when neurons move, they leave a little mark, very, very invisible mark, a crack. And that is why when we hear a tune of a song, after 30 or 40 years, suddenly we know what is to follow in that tune. Because the entire tune is not presented to us. Or when we hear somebody calling us after 10 years of telephone, the voice reminds us instantly the name, everything about that person. Because the voice signal then leads one neuron to, to uh, recall all the tracks made when you first heard the voice of that person. Now what has happened is, over the last 70,000 years, the human brain seems to have developed fatigue in the left side of the brain. And therefore all humans are becoming extremely tired of language. Children no longer will read books. Children just refuse to read books. Not because they are bad, badly behaving children because they are moving towards the future faster than I am moving. There is something which children in future do. There has been study of autistic children. Those who understand no metaphor at all. There has been study of dyslexic children who are extremely clumsy in language. And those scientists tell us that these children are actually children of the future. Their thinking is much ahead of us. Now, when the left side of the brain gets tired, generally speaking, in the process of evolution, what does the human brain want to do? It is trying to activate more effectively, more, more actively, the prefrontal side of the brain which engages with the world through imagery, through images. And so, as a linguist I can tell you, that in future there will be no human languages. Not a very distant future, but maybe 200, 300, 400 years from now. Just as we have the nodding of the head left with us, or the humming of the tune is left with us still, some words will be left with us. But the major part of our abstraction, judgment, rationalization will happen.
quanto images. Now, the, this, the main difference between language in sound and language in image is that the sound based language uses the past tense, the present tense, and the future tense. The image based language will not be using the past tense, the present, and the future tense. And that is main, the main reason why all of us are outsourced the function of remembering. You know, until 30 years back, people used to remember. And 100 years back, they used to remember even more. 500 years back, they remember. Before printing came in, they remember everything through memory only. But today, we have all outsourced the function of remembering to. How many of you don't have this mobile phone? There is an artificial chip in it. It is called memory chip. All of us have become absolutely, I am saying absolutely, unconditionally dependent on memory chips. That is the, part, the, the function of remembering that human brain is to do, is moving to an external device. This is because the human brain is an evolving entity and it is evolving to, towards a state where it can perform new functions, superior functions. And in performing those functions, it won't require the kind of time that we understand and the kind of space that we understand. Okay. आप सोचते होंगे, आप सोचते होंगे कि ये बंदा के इंग्लिश के लेक्चर देने लगा है। Don't think so. I am coming back to fascism. लेकिन ये सब चीजें अच्छी तरह से जानने से हमारे सोच में take an old popular reactionary sentiment and link it to an anti-communist agenda. This there was also this. A uh, famous cartoon which circulated in Germany uh, that Trotsky looking like an ogre sitting on top of uh, the Kremlin and since he was the Red Army in charge that this is the man who is going to invade Germany. So this, I mean, the Jew, that became a lame motif. Jewish enemy and this would of course be taken up because Baltic Germans in the Baltic areas there had been big German landowners who lost their property as a result of the Russian Revolution. Even though Latvia uh, did not go into the Soviet Union at the point of time, the revolution had proceeded enough so that these Baltic German landlords had lost their land. So these people fled to Germany. And many of these Baltic Germans would become key advisors of Hitler. People like Rosenberg, who was a key so-called theoretician of Hitler, emphasizing the world Jewish Bolshevik conspiracy. That's what it was called. And you can see the similarity if you read the, the RSS papers of the 1980s and 90s, you will find them constantly talking about something called the Red-Green Alliance. Now, if you tell me about the Red-Green Alliance, I think about communists and environmentalists forming an alliance, but that's not what the RSS means, obviously. It's supposedly communists and Muslims forming an alliance against India. So, you have this Jewish Bolshevik conspiracy. And this becomes an element. So you have a simultaneous growth of revolution and counter-revolution. The Communist Party grows eventually in size. It makes mistakes, but it still manages to grow because the people are in a ferment. Uh, Levy was aware that you cannot make a revolution because communists are willing to make a revolution. You require objective conditions you need to win over the majority of the workers. As a result, after the deaths of Rosa and uh, Liebknecht, 
Levy became the central leader, but his policy resulted in a split in the party. The extreme left wing split. There are the people about whom Lenin writes in uh, left wing communism. The people who wanted to boycott trade unions, elections, everything. But the Communist International wasn't a monolithic and dictatorial body. So there were communists who preferred this left wing to Levy and the KPD. So the Communist Party and the left wing which broke away, ultra left, were both given membership of the Communist International at one stage. And people like Zinoviev and Radek favored the extreme left. And they had this belief in what they called the theory of the offensive. That if it's a communist party, it should never go on the defensive. It has to go on the offensive. The result was what is known as the March Action. In March 1921, the communist party called an insurrection. Now, where is the objective basis for that insurrection? The insurrection collapsed. Levy wrote a very sharp attack which was politically mostly correct but the attack was written and published openly so he was expelled for breach of party discipline this was a purely administrative action taken by people who knew that his political criticisms were correct but the point is he had made a breach of discipline uh, Lenin later remarked that Paul Levy lost his head but he at least had a head to lose. One cannot say that for the others. So you had a very ultra-left sentiment within the party. And this party grew because at the Hall Congress of the Independence, the Independence split, there was an open debate. Zinoviev represented the Communist International, Martov represented the Socialist International. Where should the independence go? The delegates by majority voted to join the Communist Party. The right wing split off and eventually joined this old Social Democratic Party. So the Communist Party turned into a party of uh, nearly 400,000. But this is in fact what had created the problem. These were comrades who had previously seen that leaders betray, who had previously seen that leaders are not leading the revolution. So they thought, now that we have joined the revolutionary party, we have to immediately make the revolution, regardless of whether the majority of the working class is with us or not. On the other hand, it was like a seesaw. One side goes down, the other side goes up. The moment the communists failed, you have an attempt by the right. A man called Ludwig Kapp tried to stage a military insurrection. Noske called on the generals to support him and found that the generals were not going to support him. They, they fled the capital. At this point, the trade union bureaucracy, they were also bureaucrats, they were also moderates, but unlike the party leaders, they had a stake because Kapp's immediate decision was to ban the trade unions. So the trade union bureaucracy called a general strike and Berlin shut down completely. Not a tram was moving. Cap found that the, he couldn't even uh, make telephones. In those days, of course, the telephones were not automatic phones. You had to go through exchanges. And the telephone exchanges were run by social democrats and trade union activists who would refuse to run the exchange. So the cap coup collapsed. So you have attempt. The cap coup was an attempt at a purely military coup. It was as a result of this failure that the right wing decided for the first time to seriously support a mass movement based right. And so in course of 1922-23 you have the rise of Hitler for the first time. And the attempted coup in Munich, uh, which is known sometimes as the Bierhoff Push, 
that's also the year when the, for the last time the class struggle was peaking. It's like, in fact, it's because the class struggle is peaking. When the class struggle peaks, you have a possibility of carrying the revolution forward. If that collapses, there's a possibility of a sharp move to the right as well. So you have in July, August, the possibility of a revolution, but this possibility was dissipated because the German leaders were so unsure of the tempo uh, that, and uh, so unsure of how to uh, stage an insurrection that they requested the Communist International that either Zinoviev or Trotsky should be sent from Russia to Germany to uh, assist in organizing the insurrection. The idea that however important a communist leader, somebody who did not know the everyday functioning of a particular country could come from another country because he had been important in making a revolution there and uh, he would be the crucial figure. This actually shows the weakness of the communist's conception of how to organize the insurrection. So, from that, they swung to entering two governments with the social democrats, with communist international support. The communist international by this time had developed the united front policy. How do you stop the right wing? The answer was, they said, the united front of the working class. At that time, this was defined very precisely, that this is a united front of only working class organizations when they are mass working class organizations. It's not a question of one working class organization of 2000 members uh, forming a morcha with another working class uh, organization of 5000 members, but big communist parties and big social democratic parties when these exist, when that is in a country, the working class is divided clearly between communists, maybe centrists and social democrats, that is when you apply the tactic of the united front. You start with defense of workers' rights and you push forward to the revolution. One step in that would be the slogan of a workers' government. That's what the communists say. That this would not be a long-lasting government. But you use your position in the government to arm the workers and to move forward to actual revolution. But the point was that uh, a provincial government did not have much arms. They discovered that there were a total of 11,000 guns at the disposal of uh, the Saxon government where they had entered. Uh, certainly not the kind of weapons by which they could resist the by then rebuilt German army. This is 1923, no longer 1918-19. So the whole project collapsed. And tragically what happened after that was that the Communist International, instead of looking at the situation and analyzing, they decided to blame certain individuals. So the major leader of the German party, Brandler, was blamed. He was replaced from leadership uh, by Zinoviev, who was the president of the Comintern, and certain other people who were a left faction when put in leadership. This was a bad practice because this meant that from now on the communist international would start deciding who would be the leader of a party, not its own delegate based party congress. But that is where it stopped. The German revolution was for the moment defeated, but Hitler was also defeated because the bourgeoisie thereupon failed that now that the communists are defeated, you do not any longer require the services of Hitler. So while the communists were treated very severely, Hitler was arrested, given a two-year jail term for his attempted coup. He was kept in a prison with sufficient comfort that he could write the Mein Kampf while he was in prison. He could meet his people while he was in prison and start rebuilding his party even while he was in prison. So the way in which Hitler was kept and the way in which the 
left wing who were arrested in their camp was very different. The last revolution about which I want to speak in this cycle is of course the one where the counter revolution succeeded. This was Italy. Italy formally sided with the allies. So Italy was not a defeated partner. Italy was a victor partner. They had damaged Italy as well. And in Italy, this resulted in a massive radicalization. Uh, in 1919, the Socialist Party, the Italian Socialists, unlike Germans and others, had been neutral. They had not, like the Bolsheviks, opposed the war openly, but they had not supported the war either. So they had a slightly better reputation. And in 1919, they got 30% of the votes and they elected 156 MPs in parliament. They controlled 2,800 local councils. And uh, by 1920, there were 38 lakh workers in trade unions led by the Socialist Party, the CGL. To understand its significance, you must know that in 1918, the CGL membership was 2.5 lakh. So from 2.5 lakh in 1918, it grew to 38 lakh in 1920, in two years' time. Uh, there were strikes. The first major struggle broke out in Turin, which was a major industrial area. This is one struggle where everybody misunderstood except in one small Turin based socialist group, uh, which used to publish the paper Le Modi Nuovo, edited by Antonio Gramsci. Because the Turin workers started building factory committees. And Gramsci felt that this was a class-based working class organization. <laughs> he did not yet know about the Russian factory committee and Soviet experience much, but he drew parallel conclusions that these are dynamic organizations of the entire class. And these should be the foundations of a serious revolutionary policy. But Without support from elsewhere, the Turin struggle died down, but it left behind the memory. Struggles broke out again in 1919, leading to workers gaining the eight-hour day in large parts of Italy. By early 1920, in northern and central Italy, you see southern Italy was mostly agrarian, and this was a weakness of the Italian socialists. They had built their party exclusively in the working class. At initial stages, something which is necessary to make a working class organization. But even after they had become relatively large, they had not looked into the problems of the rural poor. So, <clears throat> southern Italy, they did not have so much influence. They built, in northern and central Italy, workers built red guards armed working class detachments. Workers were demanding solutions to their social problems. They were not bothered that parliamentary rights had been expanded. That was not enough for them. Instead of, and the Italian Socialist Party had by this time joined the Communist International. Formally, the Italian Socialists said we are in the Communist International. But the line they took was an absolutely absurd line. In the name of democracy, they actually threw away the revolution. See, when the revolutionary situation occurs, how does one make the revolution? Not by counting heads. You do not go around to each worker individually and say, do you want a revolution? You don't. Okay, one against. Do you want a revolution? You do. One for. The Italian uh, Socialist Party and the trade union leadership met. The trade union leaders said that the 
decision to make a revolution has to be your decision. Next minute. A political revolution is led by a political party. So if you call for a revolution, we will support you. The party leaders say that this should be decided democratically and put it to the vote of your membership. Even from formal democratic principles, this was wrong because the entire working class was not consulted, only members of the one particular trade union. So, a referendum of the trade union membership was taken. Do you want a revolution or do you want uh, major social gains? And uh, by some margin, the call for a revolution was defeated. So, the Socialist Party leadership breathed a sigh of relief that the revolution is not going to be called. This, however, turned the bourgeoisie paranoid because they could see that the workers were pressing and they realized that traditional methods were completely impractical. None of the old bourgeois parties were capable of mobilizing the masses. It was at this point that Mussolini <coughs> begins to step forward with his fascist party where the core ideology once again is nationalist. That Italy has not gained out of the First World War. Other Victor countries have made gains. He talked about Italia Irredenta. That all Italian speakers have not been made part of Italy. Trieste is Italian speaker, but Trieste is part of Yugoslavia. Trieste is not part of Italy. Other countries have their empires. Italy does not have an empire. This is the beginning of the process which would end with his invasion of Ethiopia. So, Mussolini mobilizes act, of course, once again, that the enemy are the organized workers. So Mussolini organizes fascist squads and these squads start attacking the communist and socialist trade unions. And you have by this time a split in the socialist party with the left wing splitting and forming a communist party. Unfortunately, with an extremely ultra-left leader, once again. You see, this is a process which happens in all these parties. Because the socialist leaders, in every case, had betrayed the revolution, the communist position was that, therefore, we have no contact whatsoever with the socialists. So the leader of the communist party, a very honest and upright man, somebody who suffered very often, <coughs> Amadeo Bordiga was a completely sectarian towards any united front with the socialists. So Mussolini attacked the socialists and the communists, but there was no united front between the socialists and the communists. With the result that when Mussolini took power, nothing happened. In his case, taking power was a slow process. I'll finish with this that Mussolini was invited to become Prime Minister and he got Parliament to pass an enabling act giving him special powers but Parliament was still functioning and as he went on attacking the unions he called his state a corporate state trade unions were being incorporated in the state structures controlled by the state the Social Democrats formed an alliance with the other, some of the bourgeois opposition parties. So the Communist Party simply said that you are again betraying, we will be staying apart. Nothing more than that. No attempt at building a real working class united front. It was after the Matteo di murder in 1924 when the left wing socialist MP Matteo di had denounced Mussolini and his body was found on the streets, murdered. So, there was a large-scale opposition and Mussolini cracked down on the parties. This cycle, this first cycle comes to an end with Mussolini's rise to power, but Mussolini becomes the model for Hitler very clearly. Hitler writes that for him, Mussolini was the model. 
Mussolini became the model for all the fascist organizations which would come up in course of the 1920s and which would take power in the 1930s or try to come close to power in the 1930s because he shows how nationalism and appeal to the petty bourgeoisie and organizational tactics learned from the socialists building cell-based organizations because after all, unlike Hitler or the others, Mussolini had been a leader of the Italian Socialist Party once upon a time. So he knew the organizational structure of the working class parties and he partially copied that in building his party from bottom up. So these would be models which would be taken up. And Mussolini, by the way, would also be the first model for the artists, which would consciously say that we are following you. So this is the first cycle. I stop here. Yeah. We wait for 15 minutes. Of a united front with the CPI Maoist against uh, the artists of anybody. So the ranks, the Social Democrats had their armed squads. The communists also had. If they united, what could happen was shown in one place. Hamburg, Germany's second major industrial city, had a suburb called Altona, which was entirely proletarian in composition. The fascists tried to take their own forces inside Altona. The workers fought back throughout the day and the fascists were totally beaten back. The only instance in Germany where a grassroots united front of workers had occurred between communist workers and social democratic workers saw the fascists routed. The fascists had their revenge after they came to power because all the worker leaders of Altona were arrested and executed. But neither electorally nor in other fields were the communists and the social democrats going to form a united front. As late as late 1932, when Hitler was appointed chancellor, why did Hitler was appointed, uh, appointed chancellor? This is something we need to understand finally. Because why did the bourgeoisie turn to him? See, the bourgeoisie did not, as I say, prefer the fascist solution. They wanted an authoritarian solution. Uh, it would be like saying that they would have preferred an Indira Gandhi solution to an extreme fascist solution. Uh, but the problem was that militancy within the working class was growing. If you look at even voting figures, we can agree that parliamentary figures do not reflect the full reality, but it reflects part of the reality. This was a period when communist votes were increasing and social democratic votes were not decreasing very much. What does that mean? It means that total left vote was growing. The more militant workers votes were going in the direction of the communists while people who had been previously totally apolitical people who had been voting bourgeois parties some of them were voting social democrat because they did not believe that the bourgeois parties were doing anything on the other side the nazi votes were growing the middle the moderate bourgeoisie the soft right bourgeoisie these parties votes were going down there was a growing polarization forces were moving into poles the bourgeoisie didn't have any other option if they wanted to stop this process if they wanted capital accumulation to flow they wanted three things first deep cuts in working class pay 
In order to ensure that, they require a complete smashing of Europe's strongest working class organization. The German working class had the biggest trade union base. The communists and the social democrats and the trade unions between them publish close to 250 daily and weekly papers in Germany. They had not only political and economic associations, there was what Gramsci would, have, would call attempts at counter hegemony in the sense that you have cultural organizations, you have all kinds of organizations which were class based. So this was the most class conscious working class that Europe had at that point of time. So, simply from above, having a government impose pay cuts was not going to work. Those workers would go out on strike, they would have serious fights and the result would be, as I said, communist votes were growing, whatever the errors of the communists. And they were mortally afraid that this could result in communism becoming again a revolutionary force in Germany. So they had to rely on the fascists. So based on this, before Hitler comes to power, we can say that fascism involves these elements. Unique, not just a temporary crisis, but a deep structural crisis out of which capitalism in a particular country needs to escape. It wasn't a matter of a, just the 1929 crisis. It was a matter of how accumulation of capital would be restructured altogether. Just as after globalization, uh, the continuing militancy of the Indian working class has meant that in India, compared to many other countries, although the organized working class is only 7%, it's had an unusual power in crucial sectors like uh, banking and insurance and so on. So traditional politics of the Congress type was inadequate to break it down fully. Notwithstanding the extreme moderation of the left parties. So you have that at an even greater stage in Germany. Secondly, you therefore require a social force, not merely a police force, which would be capable of tackling these masses. That could only come from a frustrated petty bourgeoisie. Because the bourgeoisie is too small to, and the rich bourgeoisie has nowhere in the world for any revolution or counter-revolution fought in the front lines. They have always fought from behind, pushing others forward. Next, this force has to be mobilized ideologically, which means that it has to have a degree of autonomy. You cannot go to the petty bourgeoisie and say, look, I am organizing you on behalf of the bourgeoisie, why would they want to fight? So you are organizing them on behalf of the nation. Hitler said constantly that we are for the nation, we are not for, I mean his argument was that big capital is also Jewish and the socialist movement from Karl Marx is also Jewish which was of course complete rubbish, but the big capital being Jewish. But there was this whole history in Central and Eastern Europe since the Middle Ages of identifying the Jew with the moneylender, with the local petty extorter, because Jews were not allowed into many other occupations. So the communists do not give up their criticism of the social democrats, but against the common enemy, they form specific blocks. That was very different. 
The united front from below was an idea that the rank and file of the socialist party will abandon their leaders and form a united front with the communists. The problem is if the ranks are willing to break, then they are coming in the direction of the communists. Then that is not a question of a united front. Then that is meaning over social democratic workers to the communists. That is the ultimate goal. But the point of the united front was precisely when that has not happened, what do you do? By refusing the united front consistently, the social democrats and the communists, both responsible, the communists more so from our perspective because if we are already condemning the social democrats because they were traitors beforehand, so it's the communists who had to have this more flexible policy. They also failed to do that. And even when Hitler took power, well, the incident that I was going to talk about, when Hitler became chancellor, not, in, not yet a total crushing, the Communist Party finally gave a call for a united defense. The Nazis said, shortly before Hitler became, became, became chancellor, the Nazis said that they were going to stage a demonstration in front of Karl Liebknecht House. That was the name of the Communist Party headquarters in Berlin. Berlin had a clear proletarian majority, including in elections. So the Communist Party gave out for the first time a call for a united front to resist the fascists. It's like <clears throat> so the next day they withdrew this call because they were told that a united front with the social democratic leaders is wrong. It was at this point that the German bourgeoisie decided that well, even if we attack them, the communists and the social democrats are not going to unite, so it is safe to make Hitler chancellor. At this point he becomes chancellor, within three months new elections are called, he still doesn't have a majority. But he illegalizes the Communist Party. Communist MPs cannot enter parliament. The Social Democrats alone vote against the Enabling Act. He gets the required uh, three quarters majority and he gets permanent power. Within a few days, he also, by July, he illegalizes the Social Democratic Party, the trade unions. Uh, by the end of the year, all parties other than the Nazis are dissolved and a one-party fascist dictatorship installed. What does this mean for the fascist project? What does this mean for the bourgeois project? Because I am going to argue that the two are not the same. This is something we need to understand when we are looking for today's India as well. The bourgeois project was fulfilled or if you say it's a deal between the Nazis and the bourgeoisie, Hitler does his side of the deal. Because between 1932 and 1937, if you look at the GDP, there's an 11% shift from the wage bill to the capital gains sector. Despite Hitler investing in heavy industry and therefore more people getting employment. So he was investing in industry, more people were employed, but still the total wage bill was coming down, which means that the per head wage was coming down even faster. And the investment in heavy industry was of course crucial. Big capital was making money at that point in history, primarily in certain sectors, iron and steel, motor cars, certain types of constructions. So Hitler builds the autobahns all over Germany. He moves for the Volkswagen building, large scale car, car manufacture, German capital makes profits. He also has his own agenda. One component of that agenda is investment in armaments in violation of the Versailles Treaty. 
so much of it hidden so that Germany could rearm faster than Britain and France because he is determined that he is going for a war. He wants a war with Russia, but he also wants war in many directions. If Britain and France are willing to let him have Czechoslovakia, Poland, without war, he does not want war. But obviously after a point, they realized that they were also going to face problems. Initially, they were perfectly happy. Two people at least were able to realize this. One was Winston Churchill, who is very clear that Hitler is our best weapon against the Soviet Union. Another person who wrote this in 1933 was Trotsky, who wrote that Baron Rangel, who had been the most powerful of the White Guard generals, referring to him, he said that Hitler is a super Rangel that imperialism is directing towards the Soviet Union. The first meeting of the Executive Committee of the Communist International after Hitler's seizure of power resolves, it says, having heard the report of Comrade Fritz Heckert, the executive committee believes that the line pursued by the Communist Party of Germany, led by Comrade Ernst Thalmann, had been correct up to the moment of Hitler's seizure of power. In other words, even at this point, the Communist International does not acknowledge that social fascism and united front from below had been terrible disasters, not merely for the communist party but for the entire German working class, something from which the German working class never recovered. It's East Germany was something that was created because the Red Army came in, not because of a revolution by the German workers. The evidence being that the moment Gorbachev pulled out the troops, East Germany collapsed. <clears throat> and uh, West Germany, the Social Democrats have been deeply right wing and the communists have remained marginal till recent years with the formation of DDK. That's a very different history, so uh, I don't want to enter into that. And this would be followed by the rise of two fascist organizations in Austria. The Austro-Fascists of Dolfus, for Dolfus and the uh, German Nazis. There were Nazis in Germany who were, uh, the, I'm sorry, the Austrian Nazis. There were Nazis in Austria who wanted unification with Germany and there were local fascists. Initially, it was the Austro-fascists who seized power. In the Austrian case, as I said, the Social Democrats did fight back, but even at this stage, the Communists and the Social Democrats did not have a united front because the Social Democrats were still saying that the Communists are as bad and the Communists were still far from changing their line. It's after this, where two countries have gone to fascists, two more countries have gone to fascists, that a change starts coming about because in France and in Spain, major working class struggles develop. Fascists were growing in power in France. They tried to stage a coup and in response, the working class rose in a general strike. It was the French Communist Party which initially took up the line of the Popular Front which would then be formally given shape by the Communist International. Once again, instead of going into all the details of the Popular Fronts, I want to look at the change that the 7th Congress of the Communist International makes. Here, Dimitrov puts forward a different conception of the United Front. First of all, when you look at the 4th Congress documents, they talk about 
the tactics of the United Front. At the 7th Congress, it is raised to the level of strategy. And secondly, the 7th Congress broadens the United Front, arguing that democratic bourgeois forces or anti-fascist bourgeois forces in the colonies, certain kinds of progressive anti-colonial bourgeois forces, different kinds, so uh, the formulation varies depending on the context, should also become part of this wider front. The Indian <coughs> application was spelled out by the famous Dart Bradley thesis. Uh, which was uh, published in Labour Monthly and written by R. Pandat and Ben Bradley. Uh, just some years back, Harkishan Singh Surjit wrote that that has been the central, the most influential document for the Indian Communist Movement. Certainly, if we look at the CPI and the CPM, uh, their debates and differences have always been about interpretations of that. But the strategies have always been, <coughs> I mean, the debates have been whether it's a national democratic front or a people's democratic front, whether the progressive bourgeoisie is inside the Congress or outside the Congress, uh, and so on and so forth. But through all these years, they have always held on very clearly to this belief that anti-imperialist, anti-fascist, whatever is the slogan of the day, alliances can be built only by allying with these progressive bourgeois forces. And these have been seen not partially as an economic, as, a, as an electoral battle, but as entirely an electoral alliance. It's not a question that it's a fighting alliance within which elections are a component. This is this begins with the French and the Spanish popular fronts. <clears throat> In France there wasn't a revolution. There was a revolutionary situation. And in France the Communist Party at that moment did not enter government. But what happened was that the communists were the ones who insisted this time, not the socialists, that the party known as the radical party, which was a bourgeois party, should also be drawn into the alliance. So the communists, the socialists and the radicals made the alliance. The immediate result was a transformation of the nature of the struggles. Because the working class struggles had been focusing on class goals, militantly resisting the fascists on the streets. Now, the popular front that was formed and the popular front government that was formed, its strategy of tackling the fascist forces was using the state apparatus, which of course meant that the working class was told that the state apparatus is neutral and rely on the state apparatus since your comrades, your elected representatives are now part of the governmental machinery or close by it. Socialists are in the government, communists are supporting the government, so the police are controlled by us the fascists cannot do anything about it. As for the class goals, the economic class goals of the workers, this was settled with a certain amount of pay rise and a certain reduction in working hours. Other issues which had come up like the production system as a whole, uh, there had been calls for Given that the world economic crisis was shaking every country, there had been calls for tying up French economy with Soviet planning. Now, 
this could not be a permanent solution if you have a bourgeois economy in France and a uh, planned economy in the Soviet Union, you of course could not permanently tie it up, but it was a very positive development which could be used by the communists as a starting point for propaganda which would go beyond merely anti-fascism to a more revolutionary direction. These were put on the back burner because the communists insisted that you cannot destabilize the bourgeois allies. It became far more serious in Spain because in Spain it wasn't a mere revolutionary situation but a revolution which had broken out. It was a long drawn out revolution. In 1931 the monarchy had been overthrown, a republic had been formed but working class struggles were going on. Uh, there were several left wing forces in Spain and the Spanish picture was complicated. Spain had many national minorities. Castilian, historically what had happened was Castile, Aragon, the Basque country, these were all separate principalities. Through a system of marriages, the house of Trastamara had created a unity at the top, but in late feudal Spain, the autonomy of each state had existed. Now, as capitalism had developed, the bourgeoisie was mainly a Castilian.